Hello and welcome to Nightcast. My name is Jonathan Reyes, Knights of Columbus Senior Vice President for Communications and Strategic Partnerships, and I'll be your host from here at the St. John Paul II National Shrine in Washington, D.C. Here on Nightcast, we hope to help you step into the breach as men, as Catholics, and as Knights. Nightcast is free and available to everyone, so you can find this episode and all episodes on demand anytime by visiting kfc.org slash nightcast. You can also find clips of Nightcast on Knights of Columbus social media channels, including YouTube, so it's easier to watch and share than ever. In this episode, we'll be talking to the Supreme Knight about the amazing theatrical release of the new Knights of Columbus documentary, Mother Teresa, No Greater Love. We'll also be talking to the chaplain of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on faith and football, looking at the power of St. John Paul II in inspiring vocations, and much more. Thank you for joining us. Earlier this month, the new Knights of Columbus documentary, Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, was screened in over 1,000 theaters across the United States, where it reached number two at the box office and grossed over $1 million. The release of this movie was an incredible moment that celebrated the life and legacy of an inspiring saint. Let's take a look at what happened at the theatrical debut of Mother Teresa, No Greater Love. bought out the first theater and there's not wasn't enough tickets so we ended up having to move to a larger theater we're very grateful to AMC for to accommodate us we're just thrilled that we can do this for the missionaries of charity because they embody Mother Teresa I think it's important that the Knights of Columbus are supporting this film because she exemplifies so many of the values that the Knights do of life and dignity charity fraternity I just feel uplifted. I feel like I can't stop smiling. And I can't wait for more people to have the opportunity to see this documentary. This film was infused with grace. I and mean, it's just a wonderful opportunity for people to get to know Mother and Mother's message of sharing the joy of loving. Probably one of the best films I've seen in a long time. I've been hearing about the movie for quite a while. So finally got to see it. Just a great, great evening. We had a full house, two full theaters, a room full of people that I know and love, and just see how much it touched them. It's just a, such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And Mother is continuing to touch people in her own special way. To the whole world, God bless you. We thanks the Knights of Columbus for putting on this movie of Mother and so many hundreds of ways that they help the missionaries of charity throughout the world. When I saw that movie, I was thinking one person that is said yes to Jesus has changed the whole world. I pray that everyone will see to know God's love for them and how that love needs to be shared with others. For her, if she could be here, she will say, it's all for glory of God. I'm now joined by Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly to discuss the remarkable success of Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, among other things. Mr. Kelly, always great to see you. Thanks for taking the time to be on Nightcast. Hi, Jonathan. It's great again to be with you. So the movie's a smashing success, right? So we've got two days. It reached number two for some period of time there. It's so far over a million dollars come in on this. Why is it so successful? You know, um, the movie says a lot, and I think it touches a lot of people in so many ways. I mean, the witness of Mother Teresa is one, I think, for every person. If you watch this film, it touches each of us in a different way. But I think, you know, in many ways, Mother Teresa, she lived her life by following the two commandments that Christ gave us, love of God and love of neighbor. And so I think there's a, there's a, purity to her witness that really resonates with people. But I think it's a little more than that, too. I think people see that when you see Mother Teresa, I mean, it is her life 
She had a radical life. It was a, a life of radical self-giving. But we all can do that too in a way, right? So we all are called to serve the poorest in our lives. But, but when I say poor, I mean, the poor come in many different disguises. And we all have people in our lives that need help in one way or another. And we can do those small acts of charity, doing small things with great love in the same way that Mother Teresa did. And we can do that. So I think that's one of the reasons why the film has been such a success. Well, let's hope the movie keeps getting out there, more people see it, and that it changes a bunch of lives, even if small steps, small incremental steps of service. So let me change the subject a little bit because it's been busy a couple of weeks for the nights. We recently had our college council meeting where we bring leaders from all of the college councils. I think we had over 50 campuses represented, a couple hundred people there. Great event, it's over weekend. You've got awards you give away, you've got a time of fellowship, but you've also got a time of formation. So it's important what they hear and what they learn. You were at this event, tell me, how did it go? What did you see at this? The college conference is really one of my favorite events of the year. Because as you say, we, we get so many college nights into New Haven, and they're here for a weekend of faith formation, of discussions, and they bring so much energy with them. I mean, these are these are young men on college campuses, and they are on fire for their Catholic faith, and they are motivated by being a Knight of Columbus. It's so encouraging to be with them. You know, and it's not easy. It's not easy being a Knight of Columbus on campus. It's not easy being a Catholic on campus. But what I find from them is they're really energized about this. They're energized about their faith. And the whole college experience, I think, is one where the Knights of Columbus can make that college experience so much better by bringing young men together of like mind in a band of brothers and just really enhancing the college experience. I know that was the case for me because I, I was a college knight. I joined the Knights at Marquette University. And the guys I joined with were my friends throughout college. And many of them are still my friends. So it was, a, it was a very inspiring and hopeful event. One of the, the highlights was, and we were there together at this, when we saw uh, our, our good friend of the Knights, uh, His Eminence Colonel Dolan, gave this talk on the Friday night, the keynote. Powerful talk on what it means to be a soldier for Christ. It seemed to resonate with the guys in the room. What did, what did you think of his talk and, and what made it grab these guys? Well, you know, it was great because Cardinal Dolan was there. And as you know, as many people know, he is a great communicator. He's one of the great communicators in the Catholic Church today. And we were in, just to set the scene for everyone, we were in the basement of St. Mary's, where the Knights of Columbus were founded 140 years ago. So the setting was great. The setting was ideal for this Friday night dinner. And Cardinal Dolan gave a wonderful talk, as you say, about being a soldier for Christ. And he talked about what we need to do is we need to have courage, we need to have dedication, and we need to have unity, right? We need to stay together. And this is an interesting one. We need to know, we need to be clear about who our enemy is, right? So that's that's mm -hmm. the case for all soldiers, all military men. But for us as Christians, these examples apply to us as well. I mean, there is, we as Christians, as Catholics need courage, we need dedication, we need unity, and we need to know that there is a dark force out there, the enemy of our soul, trying to knock us off track. So, so that was the talk that he gave. And I really think the men there really appreciated it. Uh, it was a substantive talk. He was funny, the way Cardinal Dolan always is. But he really left the guys with a sense of mission. I was in the Navy, so I'm a military man myself. And the, the mission is paramount when you're in the military. But the point that Cardinal Dolan made was, as Christians, as Christian and Catholic men, we have a mission. And that mission is given to us by Jesus Christ. And we need to be dedicated to that mission. And we need to be disciplined. And we need to stay together. So all in all, I think it was just a great evening. And I think there was a great sense of brotherhood there. 
there's another issue that we really need to persevere in. And we've talked about this. This is a very important moment for the pro-life movement. Uh, Dobbs has been decided. Roe has been overturned. But that's by no means the end of the challenges we have ahead of us. We, we pray it's the beginning of an end, as you said, but it's not the end. We've got the March for Life coming up. What, are we, what do we need to be doing right now for the pro-life cause? I think what we need to be doing is we need to realize that what the Dobbs decision did for us, as you say, it did not end abortion in America, right? It overturned Roe, but it did not end abortion. What it has done is given us the opportunity to win the fight for life. But what we need to do is persevere, right? Persevere in the fight for life. Dobbs clearly was a victory, but the battle for life is not over. And what that means for us is we need to be more involved than ever in the March for Life in Washington, D.C., and our local state marches. But the March for Life in D.C. is really, really important because there is legislation in Congress which is attempting to codify Roe versus Wade. So, so yes, Dobbs overturned Roe, but there is now legislation in Congress attempting to codify, make Roe the law of the land through legislation. And we need to go to Washington and we need to march with the March for Life this January to make our voice heard to policymakers and to everyone in Washington, D.C. It seems to me that there's two things we want to avoid, if I'm hearing you right. One is the sense that we won and it's over. That's no way the case. Also, to not be intimidated. I mean, things have heated up after Dobbs, and we've seen genuine acts of vandalism and real threats come out at the moment. And far from shying back, it seems like we really need to be, gosh, more assertive than ever. I think you're right. I think we do need to be assertive. We do need to be diligent on this. It goes back to what we were talking about, discipline, discipline in life, discipline in the Christian life. We need to understand that we have been given a mission as Catholics, as Christians, and part of that mission is to fight for life. I mean, if not us, who? And we can't be intimidated by these tactics. We need to stand up peacefully, march, and we need to make our voice heard. And there's a lot of us. There's a lot of pro-lifers and people who are committed to life. And now is not the time to step back or to be intimidated. Now is the time to really be heard. And so I would urge all our brother knights and their families to this January, go to the March for Life in Washington, DC. That's uh, a cause that has been really close to the heart of the Knights for so long. We were instrumental in them starting the march, you know, nearly 50 years ago. And also be active in our state marches. Uh, state marches around the country are very important. So again, Jonathan, I would say we need to persevere and to run the race in the fight for life. Supreme Knight, always a delight to speak with you. Thank you for your encouraging words. And we'll talk to you next time on Nightcast. Thank you. Okay, Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you again to Mr. Kelly for joining us on Nightcast. Uh, there will be an encore presentation of Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, in U.S. theaters on November 2nd. Further, the film will debut in Canada and the United Kingdom on November 2nd and 3rd. A Spanish dubbed version will also play in the U.S. theaters on November 7th. And additionally, it will even be released in Brazil. So, to buy tickets, visit MotherTeresaMovie.com. Father Chuck Dornquist was ordained a priest in 2015 and currently serves as the Director of Vocations for the Diocese of St. Petersburg, Florida. However, he has another important role, Catholic Chaplain of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Let's take a look at what it's like to be the chaplain for a Super Bowl champion team. The Bucs! To have a place that's filled with Bucs fans, it's for the sake of that trophy. I'm with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Absolutely 100% absurd. And yet, that's what the Lord does. So I'm Father Chuck Dornquist, Director of Vocations for the Diocese of St. Petersburg, uh, and I am the team chaplain for the Super Bowl champion, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 
So growing up, we were fairly dysfunctional uh, in my household. Mom and dad didn't really practice the faith. Dad, unfortunately, got hooked on oxycodone. Oxy turned to fentanyl, and fentanyl turned into occasionally heroin. Two months prior to ordination, my parents divorced. It was not safe for my mom to be with my dad in any way. His addiction is what got the best of him. The only time my dad was present while I was doing priestly ministry was the night before he died. I uh, flew out to Oklahoma and was able to anoint him. There's, there's not much that I've experienced in priestly ministry that I hadn't already experienced in my home. The, the Lord made it clear that he had created me for something particular. I was raised a Cowboys fan. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that since I'm the Bucks chaplain. When I was 10 or 11 years old, dad found a gate that was open to the stadium. We walked through the gate out onto Cowboys Field. I was like pretending I'm Emmett Smith running into the end zone. And then security guard, hey, what are you doing here? And so we, we, we get out and no issues. Later on, as an NFL chaplain, walk onto the field. And this amazing moment that like, although I became a priest and not a football player like my dad wanted, like, I belonged in, in the stadium. So, so here I am, like, I'm, I'm with the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Like, I'm in clerics with the offensive line on this victory boat, like, to be a priest in that moment. And I was proud of them just to be able to see that they were enjoying that moment, that they had worked hard for it. But when I'm with them, they don't need another fan. They don't need someone else who's going to give them special attention because they're some top-notch special athlete. They need someone who can love them as a father. The model of masculinity is fatherhood. Our world is starving for good fathers. My dad caused me a lot of pain, and fathers have fallen short in so many ways. The Knights have men who are willing to rise up and to sacrifice. The whole purpose of being a man is to learn how to lay down your life for the sake of another. The Knights of Columbus have been doing that for a long time. The priest is called to give of his life entirely for the benefit of the other and not expect anything back. Now, I never pray for our guys to win, but I pray that they give themselves entirely, that they bring everything they have to that moment, that they, they empty themselves for the sake of each other into the team. I'm, I'm always very intentional, not rushing consecration. But it's the one time of silence that these guys get, and the one time that nothing's expected of them, that they're not being told what to do. So now I'm director of vocations for the diocese. The team, of course, wants to win. The seminarians want to be holy. They've both committed their lives in drastic ways to be excellent and towards greatness. But so important, if you're going to have 60, 70,000 fans yelling that they know the place and that they know the voice of their coach, to have an interior stillness. And how important it is for us like each and every day to have time to be with our coach, with the Father, so that way when we do go out into whatever our stadiums are, that even in the chaos, we can perceive his voice. I'm now joined by the Catholic chaplain of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Father Chuck Dornquist. Father, thanks for being with us, and thanks for taking the time. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a great privilege. So, first of all, just tell me, what is it like, what, what does it mean to be the chaplain for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What do you, I'm sure you say mass, I'm sure you get to know some of the guys, but are you you with them a lot? Is it mainly during football season? Just for those of us who don't know what it's like, it'd be great if you filled us in a bit. Yeah, so I'd say in season, it's a lot of presence uh, the night before the game uh, and really leaning into that ministry of presence. Uh, so of course it's the liturgical, so celebrating mass for the team. And then I'm really privileged to be able to spend time uh, in the meeting hall um, and on the, also in our cafeteria to spend times at meals with these guys. And just so you know, like eating with NFL players is extraordinary. I feel normal when I'm with those guys at a meal. It's fantastic. Uh, but around the table, literally like sharing a meal, uh, is where a lot, of, um, a lot of connection happens. So a lot of barriers kind of get broke down. A lot of conversations can begin to happen. And 
their family stories come out and uh, their faith life and how they came to be where they're at is where those things begin to be shared and uh, we find ourselves meeting in, in common ground. On game day, I'm really privileged to be able to be on the field pre-game, so I'm praying over the field, praying for the, the safety and the health of our players and the opposing team's players, uh, and then talking to the coaches. If any players are wanting to come up and chat, we might do that pre-game. Uh, and then really, uh, I've, I've got a pass that gets me just about anywhere in Raymond James Stadium. So the last two seasons, I've really kind of taken upon as a a ministry of presence going through the stadium. Uh, a lot of people are shocked when they see a young priest, uh, and then when they see a young priest at a football game with maybe an occasional beer, they're really blown away by that. Uh, and so to be able to, to be a witness and to evangelize in that way, um, I'm amazed at the depth of conversations that have happened in that stadium, uh, the way people have um, seen a priest, seen a caller, and really opened up. So it's been an extraordinary gift uh, during the season. I've been told, or I've, and maybe it's true or not, that there's a lot of faith on a football field. That that you you don't Absolutely. you wouldn't expect that. You'd expect maybe outside looking in, you'd think these guys have everything. They've got everything the world could offer. So, where's faith in their lives? But I've been told just the opposite. That there's a lot of faith on the football. Is that true? It's absolutely true. In fact, I was uh, just speaking to one of our former uh, Buccaneers this last weekend at the game uh, about his experience of faith and football, uh, and they are incredibly faithful. There's there's a few guys who maybe by just sheer talent uh, or willpower are able to survive and thrive in the NFL without faith. Um, but we see the impact. Like we could probably name those players uh, and those personalities who um, who might live that way. The majority of these athletes, by the time they're 22, 23 years old, are making more than like two million a year. They're trying to navigate their families. They're trying to be the best that they can be on the field. There's a constant pressure around them. Everyone's analyzing and watching everything they do. If they make one small mistake in a game that costs them the game, um, with all of that pressure, they have found that what I've seen is that these athletes have found that to believe in a God who loves them in every single moment and to live out of that love, it's, it's precisely what enables them to perform at such a high level uh, is because they recognize that Christ has already given them everything, already loved them. And so what they're doing on the football field is just a living out of the talents that they have and the gifts that they have and abilities. Uh, but it's ultimately not about them. At the games, you can see after the national anthem, many players go back to the bench and they kneel and pray at the bench. Uh, other teams I've seen during warm-ups, so actually a large group of them will go to the end zone and kneel and pray. Those are the things you never see broadcast. And when you're at the games in the stadium, you're not paying attention to because there's something exciting happening on the Jumbotron. But when you take a, uh, take a chance or take a moment to notice like the, the prayerfulness of these guys, um, I've been blown away by that. When I first got into chaplaincy, that was one of my misconceptions with was that so few of them would be faithful, so few of them would be Christian or would be religious, and it's, it's the opposite. These guys are, are really quite faithful men. They, we have multiple Bible studies which happen throughout the year with the team, either between coaches, players, coaches and players, and then also coaches and players' wives, uh, a Bible study for them. So really extraordinary, the faith life of these athletes and how they really lean on their relationship with Jesus uh, in their lives. Do you think that sports at the high level at which you witness them, at this level of excellence, that requires sacrifice, that requires trusting something else, is there a connection there? Do you see these guys saying, I get this principle maybe in a way that other people might not? Absolutely. I don't know if, uh, I, think, I think a good many of them, those who are like faith-based or live out their faith, they're going to recognize that connection of the importance of sacrifice. Um, and I think I, almost part of me thinks like, there's so much that the culture says that they get sacrifice, but they understand sacrifice for the sake of fitness. They understand sacrifice for the sake of the job. They understand sacrifice for the sake of moving forward in their career or whatever it is. Like, people will starve themselves. They'll go to the gym five days a week. They'll, they'll only eat creatine or they'll pay for the most expensive type of grass-fed meat. Like All these sacrifices people are willing to, to make for something that they can see, something concrete. Uh, the NFL players are the same. Like Those men, they say no 
to so much, especially during the season. Coaches in particular. So we, look, we talk a lot about athletes. I'm blown away by the hours that our coaches put in and the sacrifices that they and their family make for the sake of a trophy, <laughs> for the sake of the Lombardi Trophy, for the sake of the Super Bowl. Um, they really deeply understand sacrifice. Um, I think a, a work for us as Catholic Christians is presenting life in Christ in such a way that people understand the reason for the sacrifice to show what life in Christ looks like, the, the, the beauty of living in Christ, so that people say, I'm willing to lay down my life for that. Um, I think it's hard, like people, they, they'll sacrifice to go to the gym or to be top athletes or to have hardworking jobs because they can see the, the difference of the quality of life in that. I don't know if people always look at Catholic Christians and say, you know what, I want that type of life too. I don't know if they always see the joy in us. I don't see if they see us living with peace. I don't see if they see us living with a, a different level of life. And so it'd be really hard to sacrifice if I'm not seeing that example. But if we as Catholic Christians live that out and we evangelize and we're dynamic and we're loving and we're merciful and we're caring, gosh, I, I, think, I think we'd see people making sacrifice uh, in buckets and droves. So sacrifice is one of the negative sides of this, but some of the positives of whether seminary or NFL, one that jumps to my mind, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong about this, is a kind of camaraderie and brotherhood which a lot of men just don't receive in other environments. They're just not out there. We become a very isolated culture. This is a common mantra of the, of the situation we're in, people with their phones and that. This sense of brotherhood and the need to run with brothers through life strikes me as one of the blessings of professional athletes or any athletes and seminary. Absolutely. And I have to say, especially as so looking at the NFL and professional athletes, I kind of had an assumption that those guys would be... Um, lifelong friends in the sense because they do spend so much time together they do sacrifice a lot um, and everybody kind of jointly is sacrificing a lot for the sake of a trophy but ultimately their goal is the lombardi trophy their goal is a super bowl that's a really like finite small tangible moment and so after a season like one or two of the guys maybe a few might continue on in friendship and have some sort of depth um, but it's, it's, not, it's not the friendship or fraternity that we would see as, as Catholic men are capable of. Like when, when men decide that the goal isn't just a, like fishing trips are awesome, I love fishing trip, or a hunting trip, or like uh, those things are really fun, they're great, or a good golf outing, like they're, they're, they're fun, they're a blast, um, but if that's the goal is to have a good outing of that, that's not going to bond men. For, it'll be a short term. It'll be like, all right, we'll go at this, we'll go at it hard, we'll have this common goal, and that'll be fantastic. Uh, the same thing with the trophy. But when men decide, you know what, I want to be the best father that I can be, and I want to be holy, and I want to be less angry, and I want to be more kind and more forgiving, and I want to be an example of holiness to my sons, and I want to invite my sons into that life, when, when that becomes the goal that we strive for, then the depth of fraternity, of community and connection is extraordinary. But it means that a, a man has to be willing to allow himself to be challenged uh, and to step into that place of being challenged. Um, really, I think one of the biggest issues we have with men is, is that we're afraid that we don't have what it takes, especially young men. Uh, we, part of it's like we've been kept safe. Young men have been kept safe their entire life. They've never had to learn whether they have what it takes or not. And so when they get into these challenging moments, they just, they don't think they have what it takes or they don't know. And so they don't rise to the moment. They don't engage with it. That makes community fraternity really hard uh, because you're not stepping out of yourself and stepping into something new. So when I work with my seminarians and guys who are discerning the priesthood, it's, it's one of the things that I'm looking for, is are they really able to strive after something beyond themselves uh, and to step out of themselves in humility, um, to step out of themselves to pursue that goal and to allow their lives to be changed because they're striving for that goal of holiness, of generosity. Father Chuck, thank you for those great words and thank you for your time. God bless you. You're very welcome. Thank you. St. John Paul II led an inspiring life, 
And since we celebrate his feast day this month, we wanted to share with you a look at a particular way he influenced many Catholics, inspiring vocations to the priesthood and religious life. In this video, we follow Father Stan Fortuna of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal as he visits the St. John Paul II National Shrine. Never been here before. This is my first time coming to the shrine. I'm very grateful. My name is Father Stan Fortuna. I'm a member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Been living in the South Bronx since 1987. Born on June 9, 1957 and ordained December 8, 1990. I am so excited and ready to be here today and to get inside and see what's going on. John Paul II used these notes to prepare his first speech to the United Ooh, to the United Nations on October 2nd, 1979. That was his last encyclical. And it was during the year of the Eucharist. The magnificence of coming as a pilgrim to this shrine is to remember. John Paul II said, the goodness of one saintly man or woman held in permanent remembrance by a whole people continues to transmit itself down through the centuries. It took forever. The communists wouldn't give him a permit to build a church. So he said, we're going to celebrate the mass outside. And that's when they erected a, a cross on the outside. And then the tanks and machine guns and people came and they set up a table. And he just kept saying mass. They could all got shot and killed. My first encounter, the development of devotion to him, he kind of started it. JP II becoming Pope was part of the vocation for him. And for me personally, he's a source of inspiration and he's a power of intercession for every single person without exception. I had no idea what it was going to develop into. My picture from when I was able to, to meet him and when I was able to tell him, Holy Father, you are my hero and I am your ambassador for the new culture in the streets of New York. He put his hand on my head. He said, streets of New York, God bless you. And St. Pope John Paul II, he made this his own. Those pictures of him holding and leaning on the cross are just deeply moving. I've never seen this picture before of him with his father. Wow. Seeing the picture on the wall mm. Carol, you with your father Before you move to Krakow. The day your father left you, you had no idea how God would bless you. I need you to pray for me and for all. Experience today was really awesome to be able to come into the shrine. The place on the grounds is just so beautiful. It's done here in a magnificent way. You know, all those rooms. It's like a little taste of the halls of heaven. It's important to have a national shrine of John Paul II. To really have a fresh and a new and a more radical understanding and experience of Catholic universal sense. These places of pilgrimage, are rooted in, in God himself who is love. Who would I hope and recommend to come to the shrine? Whoever can get themselves here. I previously had the opportunity to talk to Father Stan Fortuna about his visit to the St. John Paul II National Shrine and the impact of this great saint on his life. Let's take a look at that conversation. I'm now joined by Father Stan Fortuna. Father, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. My pleasure, my pleasure. 
Great. So you're a Franciscan friar of the renewal. I think most of the people who watch our show know who that is, but not everybody. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the CFRs? Well, the CFRs, the community of the Franciscan friars of the renewal, got started in 1987 in the Archdiocese of New York. There were eight of us under the leadership of our late and great and beautiful Father Benedict Groeschel and seven other Capuchins. And we began this new community to um, work with the poor and to do evangelization and to love the church and to love Jesus who founded the church and to love everybody in the church, out of the church, every single human person on the planet without exception, to quote my hero, the great Carol Botiwa, St. Pope John Paul II, the great father and doctor of the church. Fantastic. So you brought up John Paul II, and he's been a piece of your priesthood. Was he a piece of your discernment as well? What, what role has he played in your own life? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, early back on, he, uh, when I saw him as a lion breathing fire on October 16th, 1978, when the the world heard Habemus Papum Caro Votiwa. And then I see this Votiwa. So from that moment, when my eye first got set on him, and when I first heard him speak, and when I first looked at words that he wrote, I was done. And from then until today, there's more and more and more every day is inexplicable, the impact and the influence that he has on me. So you just came out to the shrine. We took a video of it. Thanks for doing that. And you walked through, and was there anything you learned that you didn't know, or did something pop out? I mean, this is a man you've known and followed for a long time. Was there something special about being here or something that you learned? Well, I mean, the whole place, I mean, the, the, the property is beautiful. It's huge. The building is massive. It's very, very high-end stuff. It's magnificent. But the thing that I didn't know that I'd never seen was the picture with him and his father. I've never seen it. I've seen so many pictures of him. But there's a picture there, a photograph there, of him with his father when he was very, very young. Might have been, he was like a teenager. And the two of them were standing there. And I just lost my father at that time. So when I seen that picture, and I know how much it meant to him for him to be when he was alone with his father, and then when his father passed, and he wasn't right exactly there at the moment he passed, and when he, when he went and found him dead like that, I mean, he just was felt so, it was really like Mary at the foot of the cross with her dead son, you know, and the, and the intensity of immaculate feelings of immaculate abandonment like never before, it crushed him to no end. And when I seen that picture, that was like the highlight. Just seeing that picture that I've never seen before, didn't even know it existed. And then from that moment then, I was then able to be even more appreciative of all the, the hard work and the planning and the love and the tremendous raising the funds to be able to put up that magnificent edifice, it, which it's extraordinary, so beautiful. I think he'd be happy. So last question for you. John Paul II had a magnificent gift for speaking to young people, particularly young people discerning, young people trying to think, what's my life about? You know, in the Knights here, Knights of Columbus, we're, we're always reaching out to young men and we're saying this is, there's a call on your life. What, what's, what are the words that still ring true from John Paul that you'd say to this generation that would be to this young, to young men right now? What's the words they need to hear from this great saint? It really depends on the person and where the person is. You know, it's that custom made. You know, it's that particular. The generic call the generic vocation of every single human person on the planet without exception, as John Paul referred to it as the innate vocation of every single human person without exception, believer, non-believer, good person, bad person, there's the potential because every single human person was created in the image and the likeness of God. The potential is there for love to grow and develop because none of it would have happened without love. So what would he say to young people today, he would say something from who he is as the man he was 
as the great saint he became and is and would transmit and communicate something to them about love and truth somehow in some way. You say, well, gee, that's very nonspecific. Correct. But that kind of wide open thing is sort of the meaning of when he says, he didn't just say, do not be afraid. He said, but do not be afraid to open wide the doors to Christ. And then he talked about the doors of culture and economics and every area and realm of human life. So he would say something like that somehow to every man, to every woman, to every young person, to every old person, to every person without exception. Father Stan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony to the priesthood and to the great legacy of John Paul II. And we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again to Father Stan Fortuna for sharing his story with us. You can learn more about the St. John Paul II National Shrine at jp2shrine.org. In early October, Supreme Chaplain Archbishop William Lorry joined members of the Knights of Columbus in Poland and Ukraine to help distribute aid to refugees and to pray for peace with local church leaders. Here's a look at this important trip and the vital continuing work of the Knights in those countries. The Knights in Ukraine and the Knights in Poland are working together in a most cooperative fashion uh, to provide uh, all kinds of charitable assistance for those who have been affected by the war. Father McGivney uh, is very real uh, in these parishes and in these communities. Um, he is inspiring them uh, to engage in great works of charity. Cieszy mnie ogromnie, że gościmy tutaj na naszej polskiej ziemi najwyższego kapelana arcybiskupa Williama Lori, w ośrodku, w którym przebywają dzieci z terenów, które zostały zaanektowane przez Rosję. Od początku wojny zostały one otoczone pomocą przez Caritas, a rycerze Kolumba wspierają tą inicjatywę. Wizyta księdza arcybiskupa Williama Lori, najwyższego kapelana w Radomiu, w naszej Radzie, to wyjątkowy czas, to naprawdę wyjątkowa sprawa. Była okazja do tego, by poznał te dzieła, które my tutaj realizujemy. Сьогодні на парафії Івана Павла II ми мали можливість зробити таке гарне свято для всіх парафіан і для наших лицарів Колумба. Це історична подія. Візит солідарності найперше, солідарності найвищого капелана, я би його назвав навіть духовним батьком лицарів Колумба. Візита ксенця арцибіскупа Williama Lori przyniosła też wielką nadzieję. On mógł spotkać się z tymi, którzy najbardziej ucierpieli na skutek działań wojennych, fizycznie i duchowo. Odwiedził nasze ośrodki, spotkał się z wiernymi naszego kościoła i katolickiego, czy ukraińsko-grekatolickiej cerkwi. Duży znamienny też, że Bolesław Archiepiskup, jaki mi wskazał, що пам'ятайте, що народ Америки і всі лицарі Колумба є з вами, і вони подивляють ваше бажання і ваше наслідування боротися за свободу і за цілість вашої держави. Що є дуже також такими обнадійливими словами для всіх нас. The one thing this visit I made to Ukraine taught me is that this war is very real. It's going on and it is leaving permanent scars, emotional, spiritual, physical scars in people's lives. We have to be close to our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in prayer and in charity and never forget them. The Knights have pledged to reach out and help the Ukrainian people for as long as it takes. 
Each month, our Supreme Chaplain, Archbishop Lori, presents a reflection and challenge for Knights to live during that month. The Supreme Chaplain's monthly challenge is a great way for Knights to put perseverance into practice and grow in faith and fraternity. You can always find each month's challenge at koc.org slash monthly challenge. And here's Archbishop Lori to issue his monthly challenge for November. My brother Knights, for my Supreme Chaplain's monthly challenge for the month of November, the scripture passage comes from the Gospel reading for the Mass on Sunday, November 13th. By your perseverance, you will secure your lives. In this Gospel reading, Jesus speaks about the trials and persecution that believers will face. We may have to suffer for our belief in Christ, but we will be saved if we persevere. Suffering is an inevitable part of the human condition. Don't we see it in the faces of the poor, the afflicted, and those in need all around us? May we seek to remain faithful to Christ, whatever suffering we encounter in life, and may we seek to alleviate the sufferings of others. For the month of November, I challenge you to fast, defined as eating no more than one full meal and two smaller meals that don't equal a full meal, and to do this one day a week, and offer up this sacrifice to grow in perseverance. Second, I challenge you to help with the Food for Families or Coats for Kids Faith in Action program. As you undertake this monthly challenge, I ask you to reflect, do you suffer well? How do you act and treat others when you are suffering? Have you ever met someone who had suffered greatly and had been inspired by how they handled it? God bless you as you take up this monthly challenge. Vivat Jesus. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Nightcast. Once again, you can find this episode and all episodes on demand at kfc.org slash nightcast. And you can also find clips of Nightcast on Knights of Columbus social media channels. So please share Nightcast with Brother Knights and others and encourage them to check it out. Also, if you have any thoughts, suggestions, or comments on Nightcast, we'd love to hear them. Just send an email to nightcast at kfc.org. Thanks again for watching. We hope you can join us for the next episode of Nightcast. Viva Jesus.